G'day guys and gal. I don't think there is a debate between which setting is bigger between fantasy and 40k. Fantasy takes place on one planet, whilst 40k takes place in the entire bloody galaxy. Now I'm not here to draw connections between the two, I've already done that. Rather, I'm here today to see if a single space marine legion could conquer the entirety of the world of Warhammer Fantasy. It might seem like an obvious yes. Super soldiers with rocket machine guns versus a bunch of renaissance era and earlier dudes and dudettes. But there is more to fantasy than just spears and old guns. They have their own aces up their sleeve, which might just be enough to bring a Great Crusade era legion to its knees. Today we'll go over if a space marine legion, let's say the ultramarines to keep things nice and vanilla, could conquer the entirety of the Warhammer fantasy world without help from guardsmen, the Mechanicus, or other legions. It would be them at full strength and with their Primarch and other special characters, but they can't just be bad sports and exterminators to the planet if things go wrong, and their goal is to conquer, not destroy, hence 24-7 carpet bombings are also off the menu. For Warhammer Fantasy, chaos won't be present and it will be the world as it was just prior to the end times, hence lots of heroes, stacked armies and spicy shit. The Warhammer Fantasy world would not be forcibly united to begin with other than the common alliances that were already in existence. Also, this technically counts as a fantasy video as well, so consider my quarterly obligation to fantasy fulfilled. Let's get into it. Firstly, we need to suss out how much each side is packing. Starting with the Space Marine Legion, cause you know, that will be way easier to quantify than the entire bloody planet of Warhammer Fantasy. During the Great Crusade, the Ultramarines were the most numerous of all the legions. This is due to them not being retarded in wars and preserving a lot of life. They also had a straightforward recruitment system which didn't involve any borderline heretical bullshit, and they also absorbed a lot of the Marines from the 2nd and 11th legions when those legions went kaput. Hence the Ultramarines numbered around 250,000 Marines. Which is, which is actually really high. Maybe we shouldn't use the Ultramarines as an example here. Oh well, too late. The amount of Dreadnoughts, Terminators, Thunderhawks, and Land Raiders that the Legion would have is not entirely clear. In the novel, A Thousand Suns, just over 100 Marines were supported by six Land Raiders. So we could say that they have 15,000 Land Raiders, but that doesn't sound right. And the real numbers are likely a fair bit lower. For a real life example, Russia has 13,000 tanks and 900,000 soldiers, which sounds like a bit more of a realistic proportion. So let's give our boys in blue 5,000 land raiders, which is still a metric shitload. Terminators were rarer than you would think as they didn't enter mainstream production until pretty late in the crusade, but 5% of the legion having it seems pretty accurate. So there's about 12,000 ultra termies. Dreadnoughts are even harder to guess, but they were very rare. So I'd say they only had about 1,000 or less. Each legion also supported a couple thousand Thunderhawks and other support ships. God damn, I'm only just starting to realize how truly bonkers each legion actually was. An interesting note here though, as the peak of each power's legion was after the Council of Nikia, none of them have any active librarians, which I could say could be the Achilles heel for the legion in this circumstance. Despite the huge size of the Ultramarine Legion, the world of Warhammer Fantasy's population is in the hundreds of millions or even low billions, if there are as many Skaven as we think there are. Due to its constant warlike state of the world, a huge percentage of that population are warriors. All Greenskins, Lizardmen, Vampire Counts, Undead, Tomb Kings, Beastmen, and Skaven pretty much have their entire population prepared for war at all times. Now, Warhammer Fantasy's population has always been as many as the plot requires, hence why the elves can get into apocalyptic genocidal wars every couple of years, but still be able to muster gigantic armies despite being, I quote, a dying race. It's jarring, it's stupid, but it's what we've been given. Fortunately, people on the internet with way bigger neckbeards and way less friends than me have used history, hints in the lore, and some cheeky maths that I won't get into because we're here to be entertained not to have suicidal thoughts to figure out the population roughly. For reference, Altdorf, capital of the empire, has a pretty low pop, coming in at about 100,000. From there, we can say that Reichland has about 2 to 4 million, and expanding that to the rest of the empire gives us a population of 15 to 20 million. The Darwei and the Elves are smaller, hence would have a couple million each, whilst the Greenskins and Skaven could easily have into the hundreds of millions. The overly convoluted point I'm trying to make here is that each space rune is going to have to kill about 1,000 combatants each. Fortunately, the races of the Warhammer world aren't the Zerg or Tyranids, so it's not like you'll get 250 million people autistically screeching while charging at an Astartes gunline. As funny as that would be. Warhammer Fantasy does have three trump cards beyond its population. 
Firstly, it has monsters which are more than capable of tearing a Space Marine limb from limb. Secondly, whilst most races' weaponry won't even be able to scratch a Space Marine's armor, the races of the Dawe and the Skaven, especially the Skaven, have some wild weapons that could be surprisingly effective. And finally, Warhammer Fantasy has a magic, like a lot of it. Considering that the Ultramarines won't be packing librarians, they will be powerless to prevent a lot of the damage from magic. Let's get into it. The Space Marines are commanded by Gilliman, one of the greatest military minds in the galaxy. They would scan the world from orbit and send in probes to investigate, allowing them to see a lot of what was going on and the military capacity of each nation. The Skaven would be mostly undetected, as would the Wood Elves and Lizardmen due to their natural environmental camouflage as well as magical warding. Likely unknown to the Ultramarines, the races of Warhammer Fantasy would be made aware of their existence through magical scrying, prophecies, premonitions, or for the Skaven, just a big ass green telescope. The gods of Warhammer Fantasy would also be stirred, and would likely begin setting in motion their grand plans, similar to that of the End Times. Liliath would reach out to Teclis, and Cain would begin influencing Tyrion. Asurian would also try to start claiming Malekith. Yeah, I know, End Times bad, but that's the law we have so that's what we're using. The resurrection of Nagash would also commence in the same way as in the End Times. Satisfied with their intel, the Ultramarines would simultaneously attack all key points of the world at the same time. Due to a lack of obvious anti-aircraft weaponry from the fantasy world, the Ultramarines would be able to likely attack Norska, Reichland, Araby, Ulthuan, Nagaroth, Cathay, Lustria, Southlands, Bretonia, and the Badlands simultaneously, leaving smaller islands like Nippon and Albion alone for now as they sought to crush the morale of this strange planet in one blow. I imagine the Ultramarines would deploy 200,000 of their 250,000 troops, splitting them evenly across each drop zone while keeping 50,000 Marines in orbit with Gilliman, hence about 20,000 Marines in each area. Each Ultra Army would face different degrees of success. The Marines in Norska would have next to no issues, blasting away the primitive Norskan warriors with no effort. Even war mammoths and other monsters would go down with a rocket or two. A handful of Marines would fall due to magic or legendary monsters such as the Frostworm but for the most part, the pacification of Norska would be quick and easy. Attacking and taking Reichland would be slightly harder, but not too bad. Due to their celestial college, the Empire would have a clear picture about what is to come from the stars, hence would have Imperial Griffins as well as Luminarchs ready for an airborne invasion. A number of Thunderhawks would go down due to hits from Luminarchs as well as attacks from the Imperial Griffins and the Imperial Dragon, but it would barely dent the force. The United Armies of the Empire would immediately begin getting shredded by Bolt of Fire, Chainswords, Dreadnoughts, and Land Raiders. The Luminarchs would be targeted and destroyed, whilst the ineffective Hellstorm rocket batteries and cannons would be mostly ignored. At most, all they could do is stagger a Marine. The few precious steam tanks in the Empire's arsenal would be crushed by the fury of Thunderhammers. Still, a few dozen or more Marines would die. The College of Magic would be in full force, flinging fireballs, lightning bolts, and beams of pure light. These targeting spells, as well as a couple flamestorms and comets of Cassandora, would be enough to break through an Astartes' armor and end their life. On top of that, the magical warding from the Wizards of Light and Heavens should be able to block some rockets and bolter shots due to the non-magical nature of them. Perhaps a metal wizard would be able to buff a few units of handgunners, giving their bullets the ability to penetrate Ceramide and drop a few more Marines. Despite this, within a few minutes, the casualties of the Empire would be in the thousands, and they would break and run. Karl Franz, seeing the slaughter of his men yet the effectiveness of magic, would order a retreat, taking special note to gather his mages. Each Imperial city would soon surrender, either after hearing of the battle or after a short siege. Before that though, they would evacuate their wizards, as the Ultramarines would gather the wizards they caught together and execute them as rogue psychers. Bretoni would fall easier than the Empire, the protections of the Lady not enough to prevent scores of knights from being blown apart, the magic of their damsels not enough to do any real damage. By this point, the Fae Enchantress had already been taken by Manfred to resurrect Nagash, so she's also out of play. The Orcs of the Badlands are significantly weaker and less advanced than their 40k counterparts, hence the 20,000 Ultramarines landing there would have a field day, mowing down thousands of Orcs daily. The Orc Shamans and Monsters would be able to take out a couple Marines, but just like Norska, their primitiveness would prove their downfall. Grimgore would be quickly slain. Araby would suffer similarly to the Empire, whilst the Southlands would put up very little resistance. Scout Marines sent into the Land of the Dead, however, would be killed. The magic, ambush potential, and monsters of the Tomb Kings would be too much for the Junior Astartes. Heroes like Prince Apophis would be especially devastating to the Scout Marines as he devours them one by one. Nagarond would be a challenge, 
With their forbidden dark magic, manticores and black dragons, dozens of Thunderhawks would go down. However, as they lack any real armor penetration beyond their monsters, the Dark Elf armies would be mowed down. Hundreds of Marines would die to the monstrous ambushes and sheer insanity of the Dark Elves, but even with Malekith leading them, the cities of Nagaroth would be conquered, with Malekith and others escaping into the wilderness to buy their time. Not much is known about Cathay, but it is a powerful celestial nation who I think would perform better than the Empire, especially with the use of Ogre mercenaries, however they too would be brought to their knees by the force of 20,000 Ultramarines. Ulthuan would be interesting. The fleet of Thunderhawks and other ships the Ultramarines had would find fierce resistance in the form of an army of dragons, griffins and great eagles that the High Elves had. There would be an intense air battle before the Ultramarines could make landfall. Prince Imric would lead his dragons, while Teclas and Tyrion would coordinate from the ground. Thousands of elven wizards would be adding their might to the battle, firing lightning and fire into the sky. This is really affected by the Elves, as when the Ultramarines are in a troop transport, they may as well just be a guardsman. However, eventually the firepower and number of ships the Ultramarines have would blast through the High Elf airborne army, killing Imric in the process and they would begin to make landfall. The Elves would try rushing to melee as they would be aware of the Ultramarines range firepower. Spearmen would get battered and torn apart, however the Swordmaster of Zhoeth and some White Lions would likely be able to score some kills, especially when augmented with magic. The reason why the High Elves response would be so much better than the Dark Elf one is due to how unified the High Elves are, especially since Chaos isn't involved in this end time scenario, hence Finubar is still around and Kalidor hasn't left the kingdom. The Ultramarine deaths would tally in the thousands, but the casualties for the High Elves would be significantly higher. The raging death and violence would consume Tyrion. As his people fell, he would draw the Sword of Cain and become infused with its power. With the blade in hand, the High Elves would enter a new war frenzy, surprising the Ultramarines with their morale and strength. Tyrion would carve a bloody path through the Ultramarines, slicing through Terminators and Dreadnoughts like they were made of melted butter. Seeing this unexpected resistance, Gilliman himself would teleport down to the battlefield and engage Tyrion in a duel. Despite the elf's power and skill, Gilliman is a Primarch, and after a legendary fight, Tyrion would be slain, breaking the morale of the High Elves and causing them to surrender. As Gilliman has a hard-on for anything with pointy ears, it's likely the elven populations would be spared. Teclis would escape. There is one nation that would likely be able to win, however, and that would be Illustria. In the end times, the Slan were basically positioned to be able to defeat Chaos. However, the Skaven tried to pull the Chaos Moon closer to the planet, causing the Slan to be weakened and distracted. This scenario doesn't have bullshit Skaven moon hacks to ruin the day, hence the Slan would see what is coming in specific detail, allowing them to prepare their forbidden Old One weaponry. Hence the Ultramarines would die in their hundreds before making landfall. The Lizardsmen's solar laser technology, combined with the Slan's insane magical powers, as well as their flying units, would destroy dozens of Thunderhawks and drop pods. The Ultramarines would need to choose a landing zone further away, likely on the volcanic island near the Vampire Coast. From there, the Shaken Marines would need to travel across the Lustrian jungles to get near the Lizardmen Temple cities. They would suffer casualties passing through the Vampire Coast as they're assaulted by abomination and monsters. However, the real death toll would climb from non-stop Lizardmen and dinosaur ambushes. Using the Slan's magic, Krokgar and his dinos would be able to descend on the Ultramarine squads, their strength matching that of an Astartes. Krokgar would reap a heavy toll due to his weaponry being created by the Old Ones. As this occurs, Slans such as Mazda Mundi and Lord Croak would be hurling all kinds of fatal spells at the Marines, crushing them, blowing up their minds, or just turning them into dust. The Ultramarines would be no pushovers though, many Lizardmen would die, but with the very ground beneath their feet trying to kill them, the Ultramarines and Lustra would be driven off and forced to retreat. Here is where it gets interesting. The Ultramarines had conquered most of the world and suffered about 30 to 50,000 casualties all up. They would set up bases across their conquered lands, suffering little to no rebellions due to their diplomatic way of handling each conquered territory. They would be preparing to launch a new invasion of Lustria whilst exploring the mountains and clashing with the dwarves. Occasionally, they would suffer a fair amount of deaths upon more exploration of the world. The encounter with the Chaos Dwarves would result in the deaths of hundreds of Ultramarines, but it would also shatter the Chaos Dawi Empire, whilst Ind and Nippon would be a lot easier to pacify. The Wood Elves would remain hidden, wiping out the one or two Ultramarine squads sent into Athel Lauren to investigate. The Beastmen would be slaughtered by a coordinated Ultramarine attack. Then suddenly, Gilliman gets multiple reports. 
Ultramarine patrol squads go missing, Empire Town suddenly empty overnight, with only blood and bolter shells left behind, strange mutters of giant rats and a menacing green glow emerge. At a similar time, the dead begin to awaken in Sylvania. Ultramarines age 10,000 years or more by foul sorcery whilst horrific rituals take place. Gilliman sends a full company of marines to investigate, but they're slowed down by the bodies of millions of zombies. Some lose their life to relentless assaults by Vargeists, Vargulfs, and Terrorgeists. Thunderhawks are slowly downed or driven back by a tide of fell bats, each bat shoving its body into any propeller or vent it can find. The ritual is a success, and Nagash is reborn. His first action is to tear apart the ultramarine company that dared to try and stop his rebirth. Assailed by this new undead and rat threat, as well as having his legion spread throughout Nehekara, the borders of Lustria, and running patrols across the rest of the conquered lands of the world, has caused the Ultramarines to be spread out quite thin. Never before had a Space Marine Legion seen such a diverse cast of Xenos on one planet. It was nearly impossible to predict enemy movement because there were so many potential enemies. The gods of fantasy would also be working together to thwart the Ultramarines, where they could, leading to unexplained anomalies and miracles which directly hurt the invading legion. To make matters worse for the Ultramarines, it's likely that the orcs who survived the initial massacre would gain an incredible strength and intelligence boost, as they were now scaled up to the new mighty Astarte enemy. There's one of two ways orcs get powerful, one from a shitload of fighting, or two from fighting strong opponents. The only real reason why the mega OP Crocs devolved into Crocs the end of the war in heaven is because they no longer had powerful enemies to fight. For fantasy, the orcs are rarely pushed or pressured, hence they haven't needed to undergo power boosts to stay relevant. Now they would. To make matters even worse worse for the Ultramarines, Malekith could likely now access the flame of Asurian, with the Ultramarines not understanding its importance, turning him into the avatar of Asurian, whilst Teclas undoes the Vortex, empowering all the magic in the world and creating the Incarnates, which were nearly Primarch tier heroes. This would also release Sigma from the Vortex. The arrival of the Incarnates would resurrect Tyrion, empower Nagash, and rally the broken forces of the Old World behind powerful commanders. The Skavens would make themselves known, unleashing their Doom Rockets and other devastating weaponry to great effect. As the leader of the Elves, Malekith would also undo the spelly cast which put the majority of dragons to sleep, meaning the united forces of the fantasy world would have a shitload of dragons, potentially giving them the air advantage. Assaulted at all sides, Gilliman would withdraw his forces to their main stronghold in the Empire, with thousands of Ultramarines being killed in the withdrawal, mostly due to Skaven and newly awoken dragons. It would be safe to say that since the start of the campaign, around 100,000 Ultramarines would be dead or too wounded to fight, with the fantasy casualties numbering in the tens of millions. A legendary battle would commence, the Incarnates, Slan, Nagash, Setra, and Sigma leading a fuck off huge army against 150,000 Ultramarines. The devastation would be unimaginable. Skaven burrowers would appear behind Ultramarine fortifications only to get mowed down. Thunderhawks would be torn apart by dragons as Sigma smashes through Astartes with his godlike power. Gilliman's supreme command abilities allows his force to hold out against the endless tide. But once Lord Crow and Mazda Mundi start casting their apocalyptic spells, the end becomes near. Fortifications are ripped apart by the sheer will of the Slan, as even the Wood Elves join the fray, Orion reaping a heavy toll with his Spear of Kurnos, impaling Ultramarines with every throw. Now at this point, Gilliman's new objective would be a withdrawal. Too many of his sons were now dead, and if he made a last stand, it's likely the rest would be wiped out as well. The magic, monsters, and heroes of Warhammer Fantasy were too great to stand before with only one legion. If the Ultramarines were really unlucky, they might not even notice the Moonbuster rocket that Ikit Claw fires at their fleet, destroying most of it and wiping out the Ultramarines' escape and safety, but it's likely it would be intercepted before it could detonate. Either way, the Ultramarines are beaten and withdraw. In lore, they would call for backup via a fuckload of guardsmen or even another Space Marine Legion or two. So, a single Space Marine Legion could not conquer the world of Warhammer Fantasy. As we saw, they started off well. Their supreme firepower and super soldiers make short work of most of the capitals of the world. However, the magic and monsters of fantasy meant that the Ultramarines could certainly be killed. With only 250,000 marines spread across an entire planet, it allowed the much more numerous and volatile races of fantasy, most notably the Skaven, to gain the upper hand. The conquering of fantasy would also trigger a lot of its really overpowered end time events, such as Nagash, the Incarnates, and Sigma. And without their librarians, the Ultramarines 
Titans had little defense against such magical might. Ironically, despite being way less armed, Space Marine chapters from 40k would fare a lot better. They are used to fighting a wider variety of overpowered Xenos, and they have librarians, which could have negated a lot of the magical issues. Despite the devastation that the fantasy world would experience, they would come out as the winners. And that does us for today, guys. Could a Space Marine Legion conquer the world of Warhammer Fantasy? If you enjoyed the video and want to support the channel, then Patreon is the place to be. Only $1 per month give you access to a boatload of Warhammer Hentai, including a Shrek and Eldar piece which is soon to drop. Hit the subscribe button, then hit the real subscribe button for more fantastical content. Join the Discord for more memes, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.